So namaste and good evening to all the members present here and to those who have joined online. This, of course, is going to be an exciting presentation and I can see good number of people here, just the right number for a live demonstration. So that's very nice. Thank you for taking the trouble to come here personally. And I think last week also some of you may have been present for the open house Hingara Open House. And I'll just take a minute to inform you what is coming up next after this presentation. Next weekend on Saturday, we have a Google Meet on the Belvai workshop that happened. There's going to be a review open house that's going to be online. Chandrasekhar here was the lead is going to take care of this. And hopefully everybody is going to join and have a look at all those 
wonderful pictures of butterflies. And uh, the week after that, there's going to be another Google Me that is going to be on street photography. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yes. And I, I think we should put this up on the street group. Uh, you know, almost, I think every other day so that people will not miss it. It's going to be by one Shrikant Nipatla, who is also a very good street photographer. And um, please don't miss his program. So that's what is for this month, for September. So today, of course, we have Raghuram Anadana's uh, presentation called The Art of Focus Stacking. Well, focus stacking, I mean, most of us here do macro and then, you know, we always struggle with the depth of field. Sometimes we want to stack sharp images right from one end of the insect to the other. But then that's a totally different ball game, which a lot of us haven't tried. A lot of us haven't tried and it's a good thing for us to learn. And what you learn when you come here, when you are present at the hall, is something much more you know, interactive and uh, better way to learn than just online. Of course, we have a lot of members who are uh, you know, not in town. So we have this live presentation. So now in the world of macro photography, capturing intricate detail with clarity can be challenging. That's what I've just this one. So now he says enters focus stacking, which is a powerful method of getting to create stunning images, which he's going to demonstrate now. He's got all this set up and he's got some of the live macro creatures here. <laughs> it looks very live to me. <laughs> so before we start that, I would like to give a brief introduction of Raghuram. Raghuram's passion for macro and close-up photography spans many years. So his expertise lies in crafting immersive and intimate visual narratives of tiny life forms in situ. You can see all the props he's got here or the little, little things. So this is what excites him. So using high magnification photography techniques, he comes up with all this, you know, the um, um, excellent pictures that he keeps posting and where we all go really crazy looking at those images. You can see some of them on the screen here. So many of these unseen creatures are now threatened by habitat loss and climate change, he says. His photography increases awareness and appreciation of their beauty, their myriad forms, textures, and color, and helps conservation, which is a very important aspect for us photographers. This is something we always have to bear in mind, conservation. So his macro photography works have been recognized in prestigious competitions, including the Nikon, Small World, and Capote, is it? It's called uh -huh. Close-Up Photographer of the Year. So here I hand over the stage to Raghuram. Enjoy. Thank you, Raghuram, for this. Thank you, ma'am, for that introduction. Uh, so my name is Raghu. Uh, so many of you might have seen, maybe knowing me from the macro group, wherein I've been sharing some of the images. And uh, there have been some requests uh, for how do we do focus stacking. Um, I think, unfortunately, uh, uh, Nagraj sir is not here, but uh, I'm glad to see some faces from a macro group here. Uh, and also, thank you all for taking the time out on the Saturday evening for making it to this uh, presentation. Uh, so I have a lo long agenda planned for today. Uh, so I'm going to take uh, take you all through the journey of uh, focus stacking, how we can take photographs from the start to the finish. Put it in my pocket. Good.
audible? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I have a, a long agenda plan for today. Um, so Varun, I'm going to show you uh, the entire process of how you can take an image and uh, process it, and uh, including the software workflows. Um, so without further ado, let's just begin now. Um, so I think Ma'am has already given a, a, a you know an introduction about why focus stacking, but I, for completeness sake, I will also talk about it. Uh, so, uh, so as we start progressing into a higher magnification, one x and over, uh, so as you go keep going to two x, four x, and ten x, you will see that the uh, DOF starts becoming smaller and smaller, and it becomes razor sharp. And um, and DOF is a, is a quantity that is uh, that is that is a premium quantity that you do not get at high magnifications. And the only way you can get sh sharper subjects is by using uh, you know focus stacking. You can also get smoother backgrounds. Uh, so what does it mean uh, in, in simplistic terms? What it means is you take uh, shots at each each focal plane, and then uh, you you try and combine them all in software in, in some fashion. Um, so uh, simplistically, you just take the. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, better? Okay. Okay. Uh, so simplistically, what you do is you take the sharpest points uh, from each of these images and you combine them all uh, uh, into a final image, and that is that is what the stack is about. Uh, so of course, there's there's a carpet to this. Uh, so the subject has to be stationary. Uh, the, this brand of photography is, is only for stationary subjects. Uh, but it's also possible to uh, use focus stacking out in the field when you're doing macro macro photography uh, outside. So it's very very much possible. I'll show you how to do that as well. Uh, so I'm going to begin with a little example here. Uh, so I've I've set up the scene. Uh, so this this image has been shot using my mobile phone. Uh, so that's a Faber Castell uh, 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 crayon set that I have, and um, I, I'm I'm going to focus on this little little square here. So I have this uh, little symbol of Faber Castell, the two horses over there, and I have the three pencils set up over there. Uh, so these are not normal size pencils. So these are miniatures. Uh, so you can see uh, this is about three three millimeters in size. Um, so what we're looking at, we are looking at a total a depth of about ten millimeters, and uh, we have the uh, two horses behind. So that's the scene I'm, I'm going to uh, image right now. Uh, so uh, so how do we do this? So we we take a shot. So this is a single shot at f 5.6. And you can see how. Uh, uh, just give me one second. Let me just get a laser pointer. Sorry. So you can see how uh, 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 how shallow the DOF is right here. So you have the uh, focus somewhere here and here, but uh, even the first, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the tip of the the pencils are not in focus here. Uh, so, which means uh, uh, this is not going to work if you want to image the entire scene here at, at a high magnification. Uh, so now, so now, well, what do we do? So we can take shots at different focal planes. You can uh, move the focal point at, at different, uh, you know, in a fashion like this. So you take shots at, at each of the focal planes here, and uh, and once you finish taking all the shots, you combine them in software and you get a output like this. So the stack I just showed you was uh, was about 68 shots uh, uh, shot shot at f f5.6. So now the question most people would have is uh, why do you why do you want to stack? Uh, why can't you just stop down? Why can't you use a narrow narrow aperture so you're going to get a sharper sharper subject? Uh, so this is shot at f f11 and here we have f16 and f22. So at f11 we have a little more of the two pencils in focus. But the second row is still out of focus. The third row is completely out of focus. Uh, of course, F16 gets better, F22 gets better. But something else is happening as you go to narrower apertures. And you actually start beginning to see softness in your images here. And that's because of diffraction. Uh, so I don't think that this, there's nothing you can do about diffraction. That's just the way physics, uh, physics works. Uh, so which means the only thing which you can do is you can stack. And, uh, and a stack well done is, 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 is always going to beat, uh, uh, beat a stopping down. Uh, so, so, uh, so that is why we use uh, focus stacking here. Uh, so at this point of uh, time, there could be many questions. Um, so how do we choose the aperture size for a stack? Uh, what, what would be the step size uh, to be used? Which cameras to be used? Um, what kind of rails can rails be used? 
um, can you do this handled? That's that's a question I get uh, frequently. How do we do this, do this handle? Uh, what is the software workflow for this? What kind of equipment have to be used? Uh, how powerful the computer? And what else genres this can be used in? Uh, so these are some of the questions I'll I'll try to answer uh, in this presentation. Uh, so, but the simplistic answer to uh, to all the questions here is it depends. I mean, there's no answer in in black or white. There's no uh, answer cast in stone. Uh, so each of this is a trade-off. I'll I'll show you how each of these works uh, um, uh, as we go along, trying to answer each of the questions. So before I, before we come to uh, answering those questions, uh, just uh, let's just try to refresh uh, what is DOF. Uh, so this is this is a simplistic diagram of a lens, and of course uh, we have it focusing on on the focal plane here. So this is the F, and this is where we're going to have the sensor plate of the uh, of the camera. So the so if you have a sensor plate here, you have you have a sharp image, but there's also a little distance in front of the focal point and behind the focal point where you have something which is in acceptable focus, uh, so or it's acceptably sharp. So now, what is the meaning of acceptable sharpness? So acceptable sharpness uh, is uh, uh, is dependent on a whole lot of uh, of is a function of many things. Like for example, how are you presenting the image? So what are the crop levels of it? On which device you're presenting it? Maybe it's on a mobile phone. Or maybe it's on it's on it's on a, it's on a large screen monitor and things like that. So what is uh, suitable for a probably a mobile phone may not be suitable for a large screen device. So it may not be acceptably sharp, and it could also be dependent on you know how good your eyesight is, right? So if your eyesight is bad, probably it looks good, but if your eyesight is sharp, maybe not as good. So acceptably sharp is is of course uh, something which we as photographers have to decide what is acceptably sharp. So a DOF is, is the distance between the closest and the farthest points, uh, objects in the photo that have, that, that, that have been sharp. Like for example, if you look at this particular image that I shot, right? So this is at F5.6, and we're just scratching the surface of this uh, pencil here. And, and this, this, this less than a millimeter in depth. So that's the kind of uh, depth we're getting here on this uh, on the shot. Uh, so DOF itself is dependent on a, on a bunch of parameters. Like for example, aperture, we all know that if you stop down, you're going to get sharper images. If you have wider apertures, you're going to have nice blurry backgrounds. Uh, but at the same size, at the same at the same time, your DF is going to get shallow. Uh, it's also dependent on camera to subject distance. Um, so the closer you are to the subject, your DF is going to reduce. You you back off, you're going to get a uh, you're going to get a better DF. Uh, the focal length, the longer the focal length, shallower the DF. The uh, the uh, uh, the uh, shorter the focal length, the uh, better the DF. And there's also the sensor size, which uh, which comes in play. Uh, and you have also a term called circle of confusion, which defines how much of this uh, this little cone that I explained, which is acceptably sharp. So that's a value which is uh, different for each each of the uh, different cameras. Like a full frame camera would have a different circle of confusion as against APC camera or uh, Olympus. So this is a full frame camera here, and this is uh, my Olympus. So this is the D850. Um, and this is the uh, uh, you know the Olympus. Uh, this is a small sensor. Uh, so this, uh, if you look roughly, this there's a two x. Uh, uh, this is about half the size. The sensor in this is half the size as this. So there are some inherent advantages uh, to sensors uh, to the with the sensor size when you do macro photography. So first thing is, um, so if you have two cameras, like for example, we have this Olympus and we have the Nikon here, right? So a small sensor is is going to give you an increased depth of field. For an, if you if you set an identical focus distance, that is, let's say both of us, uh, both of these cameras are focusing at let's say 20 centimeters distance, and you set the same effective focal length. So what is the effective focal length? You multiply the focal length on the on the lens by the crop factor. So like for example, this is a 60 mm lens. You would multiply it by this by two, and get a 120 mm. So this would become the effective focal length of this. No? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Yeah. So, and of course, the physical uh, F number is what you have dialed on the camera here. Uh, so, for example, if you set it to F11 here, that's the physical F number. The effect of the F number would become twice that. Uh, you would just multiply it by the crop factor, and that would become the uh, effective F number. Um, so, you would you would see increased uh, depth of field uh, for a small sensor for these these uh, these set of cons, uh, if you set it to if you're looking at these parameters. You would also see an increased DOF if you have an identical subject size. That is, so this camera is inherently looking at a, at a larger, uh, you know, it's got a bigger sensor, so it's looking at a larger uh, image. 
And if you want to set the identical subject size, you probably have to move the camera further, close, or you have to move it backwards. And you set the same physical f uh, f, f number and the and the same focal length on both. So in such a case, you would see that you have an increased uh, DOF. Uh, so there is one case where you would see a decreased DOF. Uh, that is, if you set the identical focus uh, distance uh, and the same physical uh, focal length and the same f number, same physical f uh, f number. So that is, you set it to let's say 60 mm on both, and you set it to f11 on both, and then you set both to to 20 20 centimeters. It's focusing at 20 centimeters. So in such a case, the smaller sensor would have a would have a, a, a lesser amount of DOF. Uh, so uh, this small sensor actually uh, really helps in macro. I mean, uh, we, are, we are playing somewhere in this, uh, this space. So uh, it really helps uh, because that's, that's a quantity that we're trying to uh, improve uh, when we're trying to do macro photogra photography because uh, the things that we photograph are so small and we are trying to uh, uh, work with higher magnifications here. So, um, so beginning to, uh, uh, let's see how do we choose the right aperture. Uh, so it is a, it is a trade-off. Um, so you can use um, narrow apertures. Uh, so if you use a narrow aperture, you can get a small stack. Uh, but of course, your lighting is also going to get uh, much harder. And of course, you're going to you're going to have a, also a loss of sharpness uh, due to diffraction. So that's that's going to be a major concern. Uh, or you can use wider apertures. So you get uh, really nice uh, blurry backgrounds. Um, and of course, your stacks will also get uh, much larger and and would also get more complex uh, in the post process stage. Uh, so this is a trade off here. So so I think the uh, the advice here would be to just stop down as far as possible without a loss of sharpness. So you decide which in your lens what is the sharpest point that your lens operates in. Like for example, my Olympus uh, is the sharpest at f5.6 and that's the that's where I I, I operated. Uh, so the question why are people asking is why don't you operate much higher? So that's because you you begin to lose some some sharpness, uh, and if you actually look at the MTF charts, you'll be able to figure out where's the sharpest point of the lens. And it's also a nice trade-off when I or when I work in f5.6, there is some uh, blending in with the natural light as well. So I, I like to shoot with the flash, so there is some backlighting and, and things like that which come in. Uh, else, what happens is in macro you typically have uh, uh, photographs with black black backgrounds. And beyond a point of time, I think for me, it gets boring when uh, your gallery starts beginning to look, uh, everything looks similar. It's just the subject is different. Um, so uh, using a shallower depth of field uh, definitely helps you get a little more backlight. Uh, the same here with uh, with this, I think the sharpest point is, uh, is around F13 uh, on my Nikon 105. Uh, so that's where I like to operate in. Um, so now, uh, how do we determine the step size uh, when you are when you're proceeding to the stack, right? So you, you need to pick a safe step size. Uh, that is, you don't need need to be you don't have to be too wide wide apart. Uh, if you're too wide apart, then you then you end up with focus banding. So there are bands where you don't have things in focus, and when you actually blend everything in software, you will see that that's an artifact. And a stack which is uh, which is built up once again, it, it could be acceptably sharp. It might be okay for a mobile phone and things like that. May not be okay for on a, on a large screen, so that once again, I think as photographers, we need to decide whether uh, it's okay, uh, the stack is okay, or may not be okay. So, but according to me, if you have focus focus banding, I think that's the stack is a pain. I mean, uh, I would I would just discard the stack. Um, so, of course, the first thing you need to do is find uh, you need to create interleaving regions of sharpness uh, between shots. So you don't want shots to uh, uh, you don't want the sharpness to end here, and you want to start the next this one. So you want to have bands of interleaving uh, regions where you have things in sharpness. So this will actually help the software blend things together when you're actually building up, uh, when you're actually merging everything together. Right. So a simple hack uh, would be, you know, just use a ruler, uh, take an image of this, and just uh, look in your in your screen. What is my DOA from that? Uh, so if you do it on this Olympus, you would see it's it's less than a millimeter. Um, so that's the kind of depth you get uh, if you if you shoot on this, or you could just use a calculator. So this is a formula. Uh, it is given by 2 C n into m plus 1 divided by m into m, where m is the magnification. So if you're shooting 1x, it would be 1, and uh, C is the COC values, which is uh, these are specified by the manufacturers: 0 0.023, 0 0.29 for full frame, and 0 0.15. So if you just tabulate everything, see these are the values. Uh, 
that comes up at one is to one and two is to one. So we are talking of uh, really the step size have to be in terms of you know or less sub sub millimeter. So that's the kind of step, step size you need to operate in. Okay, uh, so uh, so I think uh, uh, most people think that focus stacking have to be done with the rails. So rails is definitely nice to use. Uh, so you get the sharpest uh, stack when you use the rail. Um, so, but this is something which you can do only in the studio, uh, uh, not not outside. So this is a manual rail. Um, so of course it's, it's it's slow slow to set up. You would have to put it on a tripod. Your camera is mounted here, and then of course you would move it stepwise uh, here. And the steps you can do is determined by what is the least count of this. Uh, so this has a least count of just one millimeter. So, but if you move by by something smaller, you could you could probably do a sub sub millimeter uh, movement here. But that's about the uh, precision of this. And uh, this this rail uh, is is a is, is a cheap one from uh, Amazon, which I've got. Uh, but it works pretty well. I mean, it would work just as as good as this more expensive uh, uh, nice rail that is here. Uh, it wouldn't work any better or so this rail wouldn't be any better than this rail. So, uh, so it doesn't matter. You, if you have a, a cheap rail, it will work. It will work very well. So, uh, if you want to do precise focus stacking, uh, you will need to use uh, an electronic rail. Uh, so, this is an electronic rail. So that you can see here. Uh, so, this is uh, this computer control. Uh, this this app connectivity to this, and you can you can move this in in sub sub micrometers. So, I'm talking of you know uh, moving it in 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 0.1 micrometers. Uh, so, so why do we need to move it in in such small distances? So, especially when you go into when you when you start start off with photo, photomicrography, that is shooting with uh, microscopes, right? So, when you're shooting at 10x, 20x, uh, 60x, so the DF is extremely sharp. It's in it's in the uh, it's in a it's it's in a order of few few micrometers, and uh, this where this this tool would come into uh, um, would be useful in that that particular scenario. Right, and and of course uh, the controller was here somewhere. So this is the controller that you can use to control this. Um, so of course I'm not going to uh, go into details of this. Um, uh, this is a, a session of its own. So, uh, maybe you can talk about this sometime later. So how many shots are needed for the stack? Uh, so the question is uh, it depends on what uh, we as photographers are trying to achieve. How much of the depth, uh, or we want to showcase in the uh, uh, in the image that we are photographing? Uh, it also depends how much you want to crop. Uh, so you want to crop deep, or you want to create a close crop. You need a more number of shots. Shots. So again, comes back to what is the acceptable sharpness, and what magnifications you're working at. And, yeah, so uh, so typically, if your subject is small, you you tend to magnify, and if you magnify, you will lose DF. So if you lose DF, you you need to create more shots for the stack. So uh, this particular this this is an ant. Uh, it, it's 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 less than a millimeter what you see here. Uh, so there were uh, 250 shots in the stack. Uh, so uh, so so that's the DF. So uh, so I wanted to press it right from this antenna onto these little. Uh, Hair here, here. Yeah, this is there. This is there. This is a microscope shot. This shot. This is shot using a microscope. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a separate frame. Uh, I can show you later. <laughs> I don't have it in the presentation here. Yeah. Yeah, it's extremely shallow. You can't see anything. So if you see one frame, you will probably just see this. This thing in focus. Okay, so the minimum number of shots you need is two shots, uh, depending on where, where you're shooting, which space you're shooting in. And the maximum can run into hundreds, uh, so like in this particular frame. Um, so this shot here uh, is not a focus stack, it's, it's just a single shot. It is acceptably sharp, uh, all the wings, the antenna, everything is focused. And the way I'm presenting it looks nice, everything is, is, is in sharp focus. But if I was to actually uh, crop here, it would not be as sharp, and and that, that would mean that you cannot present this image at this crop level. So uh, so what is so let's see. Uh, this is a shallow stack. Uh, I think there are about six shots in this, but I have everything on the wing and the snout. Everything is in focus. The eye is in focus. So 
So this is what I wanted to present in this. So this is short at I think 1x magnification. Uh, so this is a plant hopper I shot uh, sometime back in Agumbe. And at the extreme end, uh, we have this, uh, this image. This is shot using a microscope. Uh, so this is the image of uh, a developing hibiscus bud. And uh, what we're looking at is, is, is about three millimeters here. And there are about 800 shots in the stack. So this is one of my biggest stacks I've done. So this is shot using a panoramic uh, stack and shot technique stack and stitch technique. Uh, so there are four separate uh, sections in this which have been imaged separately. And each of these have 200 shots and they've been panoramically stitched later in, in software. Uh, so that was the, so you can see the techniques are different for each of these single. So single shots also work well, it just depends what you're trying to showcase. So what does uh, a stack which is well done uh, give you? Uh, it gives you, sharpness uh, that you cannot achieve using any other method. You can see, you can zoom at any crop level. You can zoom to any device, any uh, any end device. You can still get an acceptably sharp image here. So like, for example, the, this is about less than a millimeter that we're seeing here, but everything is is in is stack sharp here. Uh, so that's the, that's the kind of sharpness that you can achieve with uh, focus stacking. Okay, I'd like to talk about some computational features uh, for focus stacking. Uh, so many uh, of the new cameras that are coming out, um, Olympus uh, does it very well. Uh, so they call it focus bracket and focus stacking. Nikon calls it uh, focus shift shooting. And of course, Canon calls it focus bracketing. So uh, so uh, all, all vendors do it, but uh, people do it differently, differently and not, not, uh, not everybody's done it. Um, it's not, not everybody's done it well. Right. I mean, some are not done as well, but yeah, uh, it, it still works. Uh, so there, there are a few things that you can see here. So uh, what is a, what is focus shift shooting? Uh, so it's a mode that you can enable in your camera. Um, no, okay, I, that's okay. I mean, yeah, anyway, I can just show it here. Okay. Uh, so focus shift shooting and focus bracketing are the same thing. Uh, so, so there are a few parameters here. So you can you can pick the number of shots. So this can go all the way until 999. Uh, but I don't think uh, any of us are ever going to reach the number, uh, especially if you're going to use uh, uh, you know uh, lenses which Nikon provide, which is just a one is to one magnification. You're not, you're never going to reach that. So you're more more likely to be somewhere in the 30 30 to 40 shot bracket. Uh, so that's where you're going to be. Uh, and the second thing is about what is the focus step width? That is how far apart should my should my shots be? Uh, so the closer it is, uh, the, the closer the step width, the step width, the nearer the shots. So there is no unit to this. So this is something that we as photographers have to decide what is the uh, step width to be chosen. Uh, and of course, um, um, uh, with some experience, you get to know what what is the uh, you know the value to be chosen. Uh, so of course, you also set exposure smoothing on. So this is important because it's going to try to smooth the exposure between shots. And especially when you're trying to blend things in uh, in software later, so that's very important to have uh, exposure, brightness, everything uh, set to the same 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 uh, uh, same settings across the stack. Else, we're going to uh, end up with some artifacts, which I'll also talk about uh, a little later. Um, okay, uh, so there's also this uh, so this is the Olympus Olympus menus. So they also have this uh, charge time. Uh, even Nikon has this interval between the next shot. Uh, so this basically, if you do if you do flash-based uh, macro photography, so you would uh, need the flash to actually uh, recycle. There is some time taken by the uh, flash batteries to recycle, and that is what we we need to set here. Uh, so you need to give this some amount of time here. So Nikon, unfortunately, they don't do less than a second. So it's only zero, one, two, three, four, five, uh, and that's slow if you ask me. But Olympus does it fast, so you can do uh, 10 FPS shooting here. So the charge time is zero seconds and 0.1 seconds, 0.5 seconds, and so on. So, so, so this thing is extremely fast, you see. Um, okay, I just explained uh, um, most of these things. Um, but of course, Olympus uh, has uh, a class leading 10 FPS focus bracketing and flash. Uh, I don't think any, any other vendor, uh, vendor does this at all. So you're more likely to come back with a successful stack out in the field uh, with Olympus than with any other uh, camera body. That's, that's that's taken and that's my experience uh, as well on the field. Um, okay, let's just see how focus bracketing works. So let's say 
Um, this is the distance, so, and this is my first shot, and uh, that's my gecko. Okay, so let's say we are photographing this gecko here. <laughs> uh, so this, of course, uh, just a dummy. It's a, it's a plastic gecko. But let's say uh, we have the first first shot that we are uh, shooting here, and and it's it's right on the snout, and you want to proceed, uh, you know, uh, depth-wise inwards. So which means you need to take shots at each of these these focal planes here. Uh, so what focus bracketing, uh, focus bracketing or focus shift would do is once you set up the parameters here and you just click the uh, shutter button, it would, it would begin to automatically take shots for you. Uh, so it would go, uh, you know, it would go uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. And it would just progress. Uh, it would do the automatically, it would change the focus amounts for you, focus uh, uh, the uh, planes for you, and it would take a shot at that, at that point, at that point, at that distance. Um, so this is how focus bracketing works. Uh, so Olympus has a has a nifty feature. So it's called the in-camera focus stack. So wherein it would actually uh, uh, you know process everything in camera, and then it would give you a, a fully cooked image, right? Everything is stacked for you. Uh, so but, but of course the uh, flip side of it is it just gives you a JPEG output. It's it's also battery hog in my opinion. So if you're going to be shooting a lot in the field, um, so I think this is something uh, which I do not recommend. Uh, and also the stacks that come out of this are substandard, especially when uh, you have the insect which is moving, the antenna which is moving and things like that. You're going to have a complete mess when it comes out with the in-camera focus stack. But still a very nice uh, feature to have. Uh, maybe uh, th there are there are situations where you might just want to use it. Uh, so this is limited to eight and 15 shots. So, um, so this is a graphic, the same graphic that I have. So let's say if you want to shoot the gecko once again. Um, Yeah. So, so uh, the uh, in-camera focus stack works slightly different. Um, so you would have to place the first shot uh, in focus somewhere. So I recommend you place it on the eye of the uh, insect that you're uh, photographing, right? The second shot would actually move back towards you and would take a shot here as with the third shot. And then it would pro proceed for, further in, uh, further along the distance line. Uh, so this is important to note as well. Uh, for example, when you're doing a depth map stack, which I will talk about uh, a little later, uh, the ordering is very important when you're trying to do, uh, uh, when you're trying to stack later in, in software, right? So you just need to know that you need to move two and three post this, and then you begin the stack. So that's just a little, uh, um, you know, some housekeeping that you need to do when you're actually uh, trying to stack later in software. Okay, so this is a question uh, that we get uh, asked often. How do we do handled focus stacking? Can you do it? Uh, so yes, you can. We do it all the time. Uh, uh, so uh, many photographers we see around the world are, are doing handled focus stacking. Uh, so you begin with a small number of shots, uh, lower the magnification. Do not start with 2x, 4x, 5x. It doesn't work that way. So once you master 1x, move to 1.5x. Once you master 1.5x, move to 2x. It's, it's, it's all progressive. I mean, as you keep uh, progressing as a photographer, you would, you would realize how to, uh, how to do it better, better and better. So I would say if you're just starting off, uh, start below, below 1x, uh, maybe 0.8x, start with that. And uh, once you get better at that 0.8x, uh, increase the magnification. Uh, so of course you need, to be, uh, you need a stable stance. Uh, I definitely don't recommend using a tripod on the field. So tripods are bulky. Uh, you need to uh, set it up. It takes time to set it up. Uh, there's weight involved when, when you're carrying it around. And also, uh, by the time you set it up and you want to take the shot, uh, the insect's probably gone or, uh, or something's happened. I mean, this, uh, the scene has changed. So uh, I, I definitely don't recommend uh, using a tripod if you're, if you're planning to do a handle focus stacking out of the field. Uh, so if you focus, uh, if your camera supports, um, uh, if you're on Olympus body, uh, or you can do it on a Nikon as well, but it's a little harder. You can uh, use focus bracketing. Uh, and of course, uh, I, I completely recommend the back button focusing. You need to disengage uh, the shutter button and the uh, and the focus button. You don't want the shutter button to be uh, doing two roles of that at the same time. That is focusing and uh, and you know taking the shot. You want to disengage the two things. So the reason being uh, um, that uh, when you when you're moving uh, forward in, for the shot, you don't want your camera to be hovering around for a uh, for a shot. Uh, so use back button focus, uh, and of course uh, the only way you can do focus stacking if you don't have focus bracketing is to move your camera, camera or the subject backwards or forwards. 
I'll show you how to how uh, this can be done as well. Um, so also you move in a straight line, uh, so don't move in an arc. So if you move in an arc, most likely your stack is going to be uh, ruined when you when you come back and look in uh, uh, in in your on your computer, right? You're going to see that if you're moved in an arc, you have a perspective change, and 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 you may not be able to fix it. So move in a straight line, um, and of course. Um, so you need to account for some amount of focus breathing. Uh, so because as you move move forward uh, to different focal planes, you'll see that the scene itself is slightly changing, and you need to uh, finally have a uh, account for some amount of crop that you would actually bring in, right? So that's the focus breathing. So magnification changes are not a problem. So as you get closer, you are trying to magnify things. That's not a problem. The software will automatically uh, scale up or scale down uh, the images uh, as you. Uh, uh, as you begin the stack, uh, of course, you use a fast shutter speed um, um, so so that you can do hand handled uh, focused uh, stacking. Use a, so use a flash, and this is important. You need the subject to be uh, still or uh, you know st stable for a few seconds at least uh, to uh, start up the stack. Start up the stack. Uh, so there are other factors like, for example, the wind, handshakes, breathing. All this you need to be very aware of. Uh, uh, be aware of your own body, what is causing the movement and things like that. So, uh, so tuck in, so bring your camera in, tuck in. So kneel down or crouch down or, or even lie down, whatever whatever you can. So your entire body is your tripod. So, but do not use that that tripod because that tripod is going to just, you know, <laughs> it's just going to pull you back. You're not going to be able to take images with that tripod. Um, okay, so I think uh, people from the IT industry will know I mean, we, how much we like to use uh, acronyms. So I think uh, the three P's for handle focus stacking is perseverance, patience, and uh, practice. There is no uh, substitute for this. Uh, it is just continuous practice uh, that we need. And of course, the three more P's that I would add is practice, practice, and more practice. It's just practice, nothing else. I mean, you, you. Uh, so, uh, so I, I've done thousands of stacks right now, and I'm, I'm still getting better at it. So you can uh, imagine how much practice you need. So it's just with regular practice that one can get better at this, right? Um, okay, I'd like to show you some images for handled focus stacking um, about how effective the, the technique is and how well the technique works. Uh, so, I'll, uh, so I'll also, uh, so this, this is, uh, these are prey scenes. Uh, so there's a robber fly with, uh, with its prey. Uh, and there's a wolf spider with, a, with its prey again. So this was shot on the, on the OM1. I use the focus bracketing feature here. Um, so it works very well. Uh, so this each of these is about 40 to 50 shots in this. So um, that's what has been used here. And I think I used the Renox. I'm not exactly sure, but I suppose I've used it. Um, so this was shot on the D850, the heavy body D850 here. And it was also shot with the Lava 100 mm lens. Uh, so, but of course, uh, this is once again, I think there are about 30 shots in this uh, to make this entire composite image that I have here. Uh, but you can see this complete end-to-end -end sharpness right from the body, um, including including the web. Everything uh, I've got every every single focal plane in in, in focus, and that's the, and this is the final image that we have here. Or you could get really close, uh, like for these examples that I have here. Uh, so this is a Malabar lighting frog that I shot in Agumbe some time back, and this is the Indian uh, bull toad. Uh, once again, I shot in Agumbe. Uh, so really close if your subject allows it uh, and if it doesn't mind uh, you can get really close uh, so i'm probably at about three centimeters from the uh, bullfrog here when i'm shooting this this again a focus bracket shot using the om1 um, so works uh, works like a charm so works really well uh, so this is a letrinia plant hopper uh, on the back of a uh, almond leaf uh, and this was shot using the d850 uh, i think i used the lava 100 mm here it's a full manual lens, so you're actually moving your camera backwards and forwards to, to take the shot. So all the D850 shots are all uh, are all shots wherein you have moved the camera or you move the subject closer closer to the to yourself, and you take a shot at each of these. So there are, I think uh, 34 shots in this um, completely. Uh, so right from here to here, everything I wanted to be in sharp focus. The texture of the leaf. This is what I wanted to showcase and how well the the uh, the creatures camouflaged on the sleeve. So that's what I wanted to showcase. And, uh, and, and, and that's what it took me, uh, 34 shots to create this. 
so this is the, the highlights uh, which is shot last week. Uh, so it's uh, it's on a free bug. Uh, this is shot once again using the OM1 uh, focus bracketing feature. There are about 54 shots in this uh, in this particular uh, stack. Uh, also wanted to get some texture in uh, to show where it's seated. Uh, so this this nice texture and this uh, little hair, hair that it has, the bad hair day that this jumper has, and the ice, the, all the ice, um, everything in in focus here. So that's what I wanted to show. But also look at all the DF that I have, that uh, that you can control with with a focus stack. You can that is completely in your control. You can decide what you want to show in focus and what you want uh, out of focus. So that is that is completely in your control. Uh, so this is a uh, shot using the D850. Uh, so this is a blister beetle. Uh, uh, this is a shot using the 105 mm lens. Uh, once again, it's a manual stack, but then I moved it forwards and backwards to create the stack. Uh, and this is a mantis parasitic wasp, uh, very small, about three millimeters. Uh, so I shot this on the Olympus uh, with the Renox, uh, and I've used the focus bracketing here. Uh, so yeah, so there were 50 shots in each of these images. Uh, and uh, a few more examples here. Uh, so this is the uh, hunter slug, um, hunter slug on a, on a uh, embrace on leaf. So I uh, wanted to show it in a different perspective here. Um, so again, this is uh, this is shot using the uh, 105 mm uh, Nikon. Uh, very nice, uh, uh, able to move back, move back and forth to get this. Uh, so the uh, this is the closest point here. So this is the one which is jutting out, right? So you start here and then you progress further and go all the way here, or go all the way here, right? At at each of these things, you take a shot, proceed further. On no no so on oh no 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 so so this uh, so this is the image so like for example let's assume that this is the uh, uh, the slug right uh, so you would photograph here so this is the first first focal plane that you that you see in focus you take a shot here then move your camera forwards take another shot move the camera forward take another shot so keep progressing like this right so uh, so you keep progressing along the depth. Along the depth, so you you're moving like this, so not like this. So you can do this as well, so you get a panoramic stack. So that is the example I showed you for the hibiscus bud, right? Uh, so you you start with one section, take a stack, move on, take another stack, move on, take another stack. So that will become a panoramic stack and stitch. So this is uh, a snout moth. Again, wanted to showcase uh, all the nice tassels that, is, that it has in its wings. Um, so this is about, I would say about half a centimeter depth here, so which means really needed to get, a, get quite a few shots to get everything in focus here. And, and right here, uh, this is where I've stopped my stack here. And this is where I, I let the, um, you know, the DOF do its job, blend into the background and, and, and let the background become blur, right? So that's all part of the uh, stack. I mean, the, how you pro, how you process the stack here, <clears throat> or you could get uh, really creative, uh, and you could use UV light, like in this uh, shot, wherein uh, we have already shot. Uh, have, there are about hundred shots in this shot using uh, UV, and I think uh, <laughs> Kashyap was the one helped me with the UV. Uh, so he really may really help with the lighting here. So if you have help, take help. I mean, that really helps when you're shooting out the field. <laughs> so. So I'd like to take a break here and show you how, you know, uh, show you a live demo of how we can do focus stacking out when we're in the field. So let me just take uh, this camera. So this is my Olympus. Um, so I'll pick maybe this this pencil that I have, and I'm going to shoot the uh, um, Hardik. Do we need to tether? There, so we need to connect you, right? Hmm. And uh, where's the um, it was left here? Oh, this one, mm -hmm. so that is our you can do it here, right? Yeah, yeah, you can do it here. You don't need to show that, right? Yeah. Mm 
volume be set up as an USB something like that. Yeah, that's what I said. Okay. 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 it Try to do this. Drop this control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the best we can get. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to be doing now is I'm going to be taking a shot, huh? Shot of this, this color pencil here. Go to shoot the tip of it. Um, I just wanted to show you a live demo of um, how handle focus stacking can be done. Um, so you start with the region. So you start with the region that is closest to you, or uh, the, uh, the the outermost section of the pencil, and you begin by taking that shot, right? So that's where we are right now, and then you proceed further along the stack, taking shots at various focal points. So uh, so this is how we would do a handle focus stack. So if you're using a focus bracketing, it's, it's, it's a lot more simple. Um, so all you need to do is just get the well done, so much. So just get the pencil in focus, uh, the outermost, um, um, the, uh, the first point that you want to focus and then just start bracket. And the bracket will just proceed along. Shots. Yeah. Okay. And you are moving it manually. The so the first, uh, the first thing, well, the first uh, method I showed was a manual focus stack, where I am actually moving the pencil back and forth. Okay. And uh, the second one was done by the camera. 
so the camera is moving the focal points. Point Correct. So you set the focal point on the on the outermost or the first point that you want to focus, and uh, yeah. So uh, so what you want to do is you just want to set the uh, first focal point that you want to focus. Hmm? Continue. Yeah. So, uh, like for example, this pencil tip that we are looking at, right? Um, so, so this is the image uh, that I shot here, right? Um, so I don't think the uh, live view is working, but I'll show it to you guys here. Um, so you can see that. The focal point has moved uh, from the outside of the pencil uh, all the way to the inwards, right? So it's moving the focus point inwards into the into the pencil tip here. Uh, so that's that's exactly what's been done with the focus stack here. And now these these shots are going to be taken uh, from the camera into into the uh, uh, you know into a computer, and then you just run it on a uh, using a stacker to stack it all up. Um, so. Um, let me just show you another example. Maybe there's a plug in here. Hold on just a minute. So, like for example, how would you do it on a Nikon? So this is a heavy body Nikon. So you do it. This does not have focus bracketing, uh, but you can still do handled focus stacking with this. And the way you do it is. Uh, uh, you would actually move the subject backwards and forwards uh, to take a shot. Okay, so what I have here is actually the more the outermost section of the flower in focus here. And then I will I will just gently move the flower inwards, take shots at each of these focal planes as I keep moving it inwards, right? So this is how it's going to look like a handle focus stacking. So so that's about it. I mean, uh, I just moved the subject closer as, as I kept moving closer. I took a shot. And 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 while taking the shot, of course, you don't you don't press your focus button, you don't use your back button focus at that point. Just disengage your finger over that because the moment you click that, you're going to lose your uh, your camera is going to begin to hover once again. So, but once you have acquired focus, the outermost edge, uh, at that point you just stop and then then proceed with the stack. So you move the subject closer. If you cannot move the subject closer, you would move the camera forwards to take the shot. And and every time you move uh, forward by one step. You, you take a shot. So you decide on the DOF by looking at it. So you can see where the focal plane is. And you decide that, okay, this is where right now my focus is on this tip of the flower. I moved closer uh, slightly. I'm going to get a little more of the flower in focus. And that, that is something that you will, uh, you will be able to figure out when you look, at, look through the viewfinder. Uh, so this is how you do. Huh? No, no, this is completely done manual. This, this fully manual. So, uh, so look at the shots. So this is the outermost section, and the focus is moving, right? So you see the focus is mo is moving. So there is a slight perspective change that I was talking about the focus breathing. That's because you're you're moving the subject closer and back, uh, backwards, right? So that is the focus breathing, and you need to account for it that you need to crop off a little bit later. Um, so that that's something which you need to just keep in mind. But you can also do something like the first frame uh -huh. without action frame, and then the just the focus part you can just kind of mask it in the in the Photoshop. I'm not sure what software you use, mm -hmm. so that our frame remains the actual frame, so that we don't want to kind of crop it. And uh, that I mean, yeah, yeah. For uh, Photoshop, you can do a bunch of things. I mean, yeah, not necessarily that you that you're going to lose megapixels, but yeah. Yeah, you can do that. What you say? Yeah. No, you. I. I. So, if you're using a manual lens, huh. 
Yeah, so you just acquire focus once. I'm not doing a focus lock. There's no focus lock on this. Correct. 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 That is okay. That is okay. X Y X Y motion is okay. You you move along the Z. X Y motion. If you have that, the software will, will automatically align. So you it 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 will align. But you will lose some some amount of uh, megapixels because you have this X Y motion now. Uh, so what you shouldn't do is actually move in an arc. You should not you should not move like this. So that's that's problem. But you you can definitely move X Y. That is that is that is allowed. And uh, and uh, some amount is uh, is okay. I think twenty percent is uh, is what I think is the is a decent limit for this X one motion. Anything more than that, it's it begins to get really messy. I mean, uh, then it, the stacking software becomes uh, it it does a, it, it becomes completely messy if you're trying to stack things which are completely you know uh, sixty percent off. That is it's not going to work. <laughs> this is about I think uh, twenty five shots. What was taken here? Yeah. So it took. So you you saw it just took about. Yeah. Yeah, I said 25 shots with this. No, I haven't said 25 shots. This is manually done. Manually done. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's uh, one question uh, from Mr. Navin. Yeah. Are there any lenses which can help move automatically instead of using rail or manual manually move? Yeah, you can, you could do this. Like for example, uh, this is the one of five lens, right? Huh. So if you use the focus uh, shift shooting, you could actually set it up. But it's it's much harder to set it up here. The lens can move. The lens will do the focus shift movements. Oh, okay. So like for example, the I showed you this Olympus shot, right? The Olympus shot. I'll, I'll show you the same shot if how we would do it with the focus bracketing here. Uh, So this is a autofocus bracket which the camera is doing, and it's actually moving the focal points for you. Uh, I'm not doing any any uh, movement of back and forth. That movement is being done by the lens here, by the lens here. And this is about a 50 shot bracket that you, if you can see, uh, it took probably about uh, less than a few seconds, right? About four seconds. And uh, it it can it can be very successful on the on the field when you're trying to shoot very small insects and things like that, right? Or or flowers, for example. It's a very powerful technique. It doesn't take too long. I mean, we we think that uh, we don't get enough time for a shot, but we do get a few seconds to take shots, and that's all you need—a few seconds to take shots like this. No, it's just about uh, practice. That's it. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. You can't view it in in a DSLR, but on a mirrorless, you can still see it. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see it. So the, so so. So that's that's a big advantage actually. So uh, so like for example, the way I've set up focus bracketing on my Olympus is, I have about 130 shots. That's the limit I think I will ever reach on the field. And I've set the focus differential as two, uh, which works for me very well because if I clip on a Renox, I lose some DOF, but that's still enough because I've set a very narrow differential. It still accounts for that. Uh, and I can actually see as you as you take a shot. Uh, let me just. Uh, um, so um, <laughs> maybe I can show it to you. This, <laughs> huh? Yeah. Okay. So let's, for example, uh, shoot this gecko once again. Um, and right now it's set up for focus stacking, uh, and this is on live view, so you can actually see uh, uh, what's happening here. In the, in the camera. 
uh, so uh, so I acquire focus here. So I am at the auto, outermost tip of the gecko, and then you just begin the shot. So you can see the focus which is shifting inside, and you can stop at any point. I mean, the moment you think that you have a full stack, you just stop. I mean, that's it. Uh, yeah, so Olympus uh, has this nice feature that you can uh, map any button to any function. So I have a, a, a button that I've set up here that I can flick it on and off. So DA50, that's a big uh, minus. So you need to go into menus and actually set it up. And it also takes longer uh, because uh, the uh, the charge time that it has, right? It's, a, it's only about a second. So it takes much larger. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the yeah. So this I'm using the Godox V863. It's one of the fastest flashes right now in the market. Uh, so it does. Uh, it can recycle. It has a recycle time of about 0 0.1 seconds. So which means you can do a 10 FPS focus stack that I just did right now, right? So which means uh, every second I'm taking 10 shots. So for five, for with five seconds, I've taken 50 shots. So, uh, so, huh? So I, I set it to about one by 32, uh, the flash power. Yeah. One by one, it'll take much longer. So the recycle time will be about a second there. So that's that's probably not where you want to work in. Yeah, so uh, this, this is one of the fastest flashes right now and uh, and very uh, well done, especially if you want to use it for focus stacking on the field. Uh, so I think this is uh, what I wanted to show about uh, how to do focus stacking here. Uh, so let's go to the software part of uh, how do we process stacks, right? Um, so let's see how stacks are assembled. Uh, so there are two softwares. Uh, um, so the first one is, of course, Zerin Stacker. It is, in my opinion, one of the best stackers out there. Uh, and it, it is my recommendation as well to, uh, as, as a software to be used. Max and DMAP. I'll explain in detail what, what each of these mean. Yeah. If you could just talk. What is the question? Okay, so, mm. yes. You can read it loud. For handled manual stack, what would be the minimum amount of images to get a get a decent in focus detailed shot as we'll not be in control of moving the focal plane in equal distance between shots? Um, so this, I think, is once again, uh, I think, as photographers, you need to decide. Um, and you can uh, this is something you, uh, when you look into the viewfinder, you know which part of the uh, subject is in focus, and you just move it by that amount that the next blurry part of the image comes in focus and you take a shot. So that's the way to do it. So how many shots you need, uh, that is uh, completely dependent on what you're trying to showcase. But when I do a manual focus stack, this is what I do. I go from front to back and then back to front. I take two stacks uh, so that I'm, I'm, I'm doubly sure that I have something, uh, even if I have missed shot somewhere, when, while coming back, I've taken the shot. Uh, so which means I do 2x the effort with a manual stack. With a focus bracket, uh, I don't do that. It's just uh, one pass, just proceed forwards and take one shot. But uh, with a manual, uh, manual focus stack where I'm actually moving the subject backwards and forwards, I would, I would progress once forward and come back the opposite direction. So that's the way I would do it. Um, so of course, if this is a hit or miss. Uh, so uh, there is no guarantee when you, when you come back and see uh, in, in post-processing stage, it, it may be a successful stack. It may not be a successful stack. But that's the nature of this photography, the way it works. No, I don't no, I don't see anything else. Thanks. Yeah. So Zerin has the uh, one of the best retouching tools. So retouching is very important when you're actually uh, doing focus stacking. I'll, I'll show you how retouching works as well. Uh, so, and if you do uh, microscope photography, this is definitely a tool to be used. This has the most wins. Uh, most most people 
who have won Micron Small World will use the software, and this is one of the best softwares out there. So it comes to the multi-tier license. Uh, it's 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 one-time payment, and you can pay pay uh, pay for advanced features. It's it's just the delta that you need to pay. The second one, which is also very good, is the Helicon Focus. Uh, so this is extremely fast, much 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 faster than the Zerine Stacker. <clears throat> it has two excellent methods: the DMAP, the pyramid, and there's another method called the weighted average. Uh, it once again comes with a multi-tier license, one time, um, uh, and you can use it on multiple computers as well. So, uh, so that's that's the um, that's uh, very nice about Zerine and Helicon. So there are these other softwares as well, which I do not uh, recommend. Of course, your experience may may be different, uh, so your mileage may vary. So the first one being Photoshop is extremely expensive. You pay a monthly fee. Uh, but it also has the highest CPU and RAM requirements when you're when you're trying to <coughs> stack large, create large large stacks, and it and it provides one of the worst outputs. So uh, it does many things very very nicely, many other things many uh, very nicely, but not not stacking. Combined ZP is on the other other end of the spectrum. It is free, primitive. Uh, in my trials with it, I could not get it to work with uh, you know a, a medium sized stack of about 30 shots. So this is something which I've not used. Affinity is once again a competitor for Photoshop. I haven't heard any good reviews about it, but uh, yeah, it, it's yeah. one of you have tried it. Yeah, maybe you can. Huh? Affinity, is Affinity is good, but I don't know how good it is for stacking. I'm talking it from a perspective of stacking, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for, for example, Photoshop doesn't do a very good job at stacking. Yeah. So it doesn't give you a lot of uh, uh, functionality. And once the layers are formed, that's it. I mean, you can't do much with Photoshop. But uh, that's where these other softwares come in because they give you that extra ability to retouch a stack, to create a stack with the with the highest quality output that you can. And that's where Zerine wins over Helicon because it has one of the best retouching tools. So, uh, so before we begin to understand, uh, I mean, which algorithm to be used for stacking, right? You need to look a little bit about what each of the stacking alg algorithm does so that we get a sense about how, which method to be used for stacking. So the first method uh, that is frequently used is the depth map. And what a depth map does is, uh, let's for example, say that I'm, we're gonna photograph my fist here. And this is my first shot I take, second shot, third shot, fourth shot. And at, at some point here, you can continue to take shots, but there's nothing here, right? So this is free space here. So depth map, you can you can look at it like you you put a fabric on top of my wrist, and at every point it touches, the fabric would just stick to the, stick to the uh, image here, and then you would get uh, get something which looks like my fist, but it isn't my fist. It's just a map. It's just a map of my fist. So that's the depth that you're getting out of it, right? So this is what a depth map does. So it would it would look at each of the shots, proceed vertically down along each pixel, and try to figure out which is my sharpest pixel. But just proceeding vertically down along a pixel will not let, will not, you will not know which is your sharpest pixel because ultimately it's just light, it's just a, a value of light which is present in that. So how do you figure out which is my sharpest pixel? So for that you have to look at neighboring pixels around. And the way you can look at neighboring pixels, you, you, you decide what is my estimation radius uh, and how far apart should I look uh, to figure out where are my contrast points. And if you use a if you use a large uh, large circle or large estimation radius, you're likely to have uh, you're likely to have uh, bigger halos. I'll come to what halos are. And if you use a, use a smaller uh, estimation radius, you're likely to get better uh, details, the finer details. But you're also going to get hard edged halos, right? So we'll see how each of these works. <clears throat> so depth map stacks, of course, like I was saying, right? Uh, like for example, the in focus uh, in camera focus stack. When it, it it orders the third and fourth shot, uh, this, the the uh, uh, second and third shot to be closer to you, so it, you just need to reorder it when you're when you're doing a depth map stack later in software. Uh, so the two methods, uh, uh, so Zerin uses calls it DMAP and Helicon calls it uh, method B. Both are excellent methods. Both work very well. Both Zerin and Helicon. So Helicon uh, uh, in particularly works uh, extremely well in the sense that uh, it's it's really fast. Compared to to Zerin, uh, so Z I'll we'll talk about that in a bit as well. Okay, the second method is the pyramid method. Uh, it's called the Pmax method in, in Zerin, and it's called the method C in in Helicon. 
Uh, so the pyramid method would, would take a smaller uh, pyramid representation of the image, and then it would try to estimate where are my sharpest, sharpest points in, in the, this one, in the, um, in the final image. Um, so yeah, and the third method is called the weighted average. So here you would compute a weight based on the pixel uh, for each pixel based on its contrast. And this is method A of Helicon. So here, once again, you need to provide a radius. Uh, say, what is my radius to be used for a weighted average um, uh, stack that you're doing? Right. So the weighted average stack, in my experience, does not work very well. Uh, so this is something which I don't use. Uh, but I regularly use the depth map stack and the pyramid stack. I'll, I'll show you uh, a little more about how these stacks work. OK, so now which method do we use <coughs> when we stack? So, <coughs> so I'm going to leave the weighted average uh, uh, method out of the equation here because uh, that's, that, in my opinion, provides really bad output. So we're going to talk about the pyramid um, and the Pmax or the DMAP method. So the pyramid method has uh, a very small learning curve. I mean, you just load your images into software, just say render, and then you have, you have the final output. So there are no knobs to be played around with the Pmax and the pyramid method. So the learning curve is, is very, very, uh, very uh, shallow in this case. Uh, so it also works very well with tricky over, uh, overlaps. Like for example, if you have bristly bugs with a lot of antennae, hair, and things like that, which are crisscrossing. So the Pmax will work very well. So but what it does not work well with is it alters the colors and contrast. And that's, that's, that's a big negative for, for the pyramid method. So the DMAP, on the other hand, it has uh, more controls to learn. I'll uh, show these controls a little later. They're not very good with overlap. So if you have intersecting uh, hair and uh, antennae and things like that, you would see that the DMAP method will not work very well. But what it does very well is it does not accumulate noise. The noise is accumulated in, in the Pmax and Pyramid method. That's because each of these flame frames that we have shot here is going to be contributing some noise to the final image. And that is going to uh, pull down the final quality of the image. Right. So, but the DMAP stack will not do that. It does not accumulate noise. It will also not change the contrast and color. It will give you very rich tones and colors. So what is the best method to use? So you always start with the DMAP stack and retouch a DMAP stack with a Pmax stack. So this is one of the first, uh, uh, I mean, the, the mistakes which people stack when people beginning stacking do, right? So they, they, there's, a, there's a steep learning curve for DMAP and they think the DMAP is not doing a good job and they start using the Pmax. But then you start getting substandard stacks with Pmax. But what you should actually be doing is use the DMAP and then retouch it using the Pmax. So that's the way we should do it. Okay, so these are some hardware requirements uh, that is needed for these softwares. So it works on all three platforms, Windows, Mac, Linux. Uh, so you would need a multi-core processor. Uh, having a GPU definitely helps, especially for Zerine because it's very heavy. Um, and Zerin stacker in particular takes about one GB per 10 megapixels. So if you are shooting a 45 megapixel uh, image, uh, so you probably need about six GB of, uh, of RAM over there. And there's no limit on the number of frames that Zerin can take. It can go all the way until 800 frames. Um, no, no issues with that. Uh, so you also need a very sufficiently large uh, hard disk. Uh, so my recommendation is to always use TIFF, uh, to stack in TIFF, but TIFF is, is extremely uh, big in size, right? So for example, 45 megapixel uh, image would be about 250 megabytes. And, uh, and, and that was the method I was using for a long time uh, until my hard disk filled up and I didn't have any more space. And so these days I just do JPEG stacks, uh, which is okay. I mean, you will still get uh, reasonable outputs, but uh, of course my recommendation is use TIFF for uh, stacking. Okay, so uh, you probably have, you. You, you might be seeing uh, some of your peers doing this work and you probably go out and sh shoot a stack and, and then you come load it up in software and the stacker seems to be doing a suboptimal job. So, so what's, what's going on? So there are a bunch of stacking artifacts that need to be addressed right in the, in the retouching phase. Uh, so, so these are some of the ar artifacts that can occur when stack stacking and, and some of these are edge streaks. So the edge streaks is a result of focus breathing. The, what I was explaining early on when I was doing the focus bracketing, right? Then you have something known as Bigley worms, and this is because of sensor dust trails. You have focus banding, uh, that's because of missed shots, what I just explained in the back. You have background banding, if you have changes in lighting, you have exposure changes between, between your shot, then you're going to, going to have background banding. So that can be problematic. Then you have echoes. Um, echoes can be 
can can ruin your stack so what echoes are as if you have motion both in the background and foreground maybe a part of the insect the antenna is moving at this like that so that's that's an echo and that has the potential to ruin the stack so uh, some stacks can be salvaged i'll show you a stack wherein you can salvage echoes and of course uh, you have if you have motion in the background that is it's it's out of out of focus but you still have motion in the background so that's called ghosting and the last is of course halos um so that's caused by the stacker itself uh, because of errors in its estimation of uh, it's it's uh, uh, when it's trying to figure out which is the high contrast uh, areas between when it's trying to find the edges edges of the image so that's where the halo comes from so these are some this some examples I have to show you some of the artifacts if you see here so this is a big leaf bomb so this is because of the sensor dust trail uh, so what the image that we have is is a is a close crop of a blue pansy i think it's a blue pansy i don't know for sure a uh, butterfly wing uh, this is shot under the, under the microscope uh, so these are halos here so this 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 is dust but you see this fuzziness around the dust so that's a halo you also have halo at these edges here so these are all halos here so this is another example that i have so this is a uh, queen bee or uh, queen queen ant uh, which is shed its wings and it's and it's about to uh, looking for a nest uh, nesting spot so you can see the antennas moving so these are the echoes that i was talking about um and you also have the moth parts which are moving here so uh, you can see all these are all echoes here so uh, this may look like a failed stack uh, for some for somebody that's uh, this be just begun stacking um and of course this focus banding so i have a miss, miss shot here so i have this part in focus i have a miss shot here and then i go to the next part so this is a band so you can either choose to drop frames past this and showcase only this part or you could just discard the frame altogether so that's totally dependent on you or you could choose to choose to show the frame at for a small form factor device like for example on your mobile phone or whatsapp and things like that but it still look reasonably sharp you step back a little bit it still look reasonably sharp okay so the magic for focus stacking is in the retouching phase and if you're not retouching you're not getting the best quality stacks out of it if you're just relying on your camera to do stacking it's not going to work you're not going to be getting the best quality out of it so the entire magic comes in uh, in the retouching so retouching can be quite intensive uh, it can take a lot of a uh, lot of time effort um so this is the finished stack that you can see uh, the same the queen ant uh, that i shot so uh, right from the antenna all the artifacts have been addressed the halos have been addressed i've also uh, <clears throat> um you know i also let dof create play its game here by blurring out whatever parts i don't need it to be in focus so so that's that's how a finished stack would look like and this is the stack for the uh, butterfly wing everything all these artifacts everything has been addressed here so this little thing is a, is a pollen grain which i chose to keep in the uh, final retouch space um but uh, you don't see any hard edged halos uh, everything's been fixed here so uh so uh, i i'll show it to you in a live uh, demonstration how do we address these artifacts but this should how uh, this this is how the workflow should be if you're doing focus stacking uh, so how do we go from a raw image to the final image so you always shoot raw don't shoot jpeg because raw has uh, it gives you final control over many of the things like exposure highlights shadows those are things that you can correct later but you use similar settings for the entire stack you don't uh, you know the entire stack has to have a similar set of settings you should not have a brightness different on one and brightness different on another one so this would this would bring about artifacts when you're trying to uh, for, do it in software so keep the settings the same and uh, of course save it to tiff if you don't have hard disk space uh, save it to jpeg um, and use your favorite stacker whichever that is zerine helicon if you like photoshop you can do it in that as well and of course uh, final corrections adjustments and things like that you do it in photoshop and uh, this is a necessity in my opinion you need to do a noise reduction and the reason for that being that uh, if you do large stacks uh, if you do 30 40 shots or or even larger like for example microscope stacks but you're doing hundreds so it starts picking up all the sensor noise and that sensor noise has to be reduced and the only way you can do it is with the post process phase and that comes in via this noise reduction phase here 
So this is my workflow uh, that I use uh, for focus stacking. Um, of course, you could tweak it to your uh, uh, the way you want to do it. So I'd like to show you some walkthroughs, uh, software walkthroughs, so how Zerine and Helicon works. Um, so let me just go to this. Yeah, I want to miss. Okay, I'm going to show you the uh, the same the <coughs> Queen and stand uh, stack that I have. And the first thing we do is uh, so the project is already created here, uh, but I'll just show you some of the things here. Okay, let's look a little bit of the about the preferences here. Okay, the first thing we see is the alignment. Um, so this is the shift X and shift Y. Somebody is asking whether that's going to be a problem uh, if you have some motion in X and Y. So that's not a problem. So you can set your percentages here. Uh, 20% is what I've set it to. So which means you can allow for a 20% uh, shift in X and Y. So as long as you have a subject in the in the in somewhere in the middle of the frame, it should be fine. So you should be able to correct it. And scale is about 50%. So there could be a scale difference as you move uh, back and forth. So this, this is going to account for the scale part. Uh, so you also have the uh, some rotation. Some rotation is also okay. So maybe uh, the you have turned your camera uh, rotated around. So some rotation is fine. Um, you also want to address uh, address this brightness. So Zerin can also uh, correct the brightness and can do this automatic order. So this so these are some things that I like to use. Okay. So this uh, DMAP settings is uh, is is quite intricate here. So this is the estimation radius I was talking about. So so this decides how much, uh, how many pixels around each pixel I need to look for to decide which is an edge and which is not an edge. So this is what it's going to give you. So if you use a, if you use a very large estimation radius, you're likely to get very large halos, and if you use a very small estimation radius, you're likely to be likely to get hard edged hard edged halos. So you need to use some kind of trade-off. There is no uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, rule of thumb here, what has to be used. So that that is something we as photographers have to decide. It's also possible that one estimation radius will not be uh, suitable for the entire image. There might be sections of the image that where you have to use multiple estimation radius. So you have to redo the stack multiple times with different estimation radius. So depending on what, what we see, right? So, so of course the smoothing radius in, in uh, this one, it decides how much uh, so once it for it's it's found its edges, it uses this to smooth out some some of the pixels around it, and and it decides whether my pixel is sharp or not not sharp. So this is about half of the estimation radius, and that is something which is not in our control. We can just leave that out, and we can just worry only about the estimation radius. So as far as Pmax settings goes, there's nothing nothing to be done. So there's a very small learning curve here. So the only thing that you can use is grid suppression that. Has to be used. It does some little bit of noise suppression. Um, still not enough, uh, in my opinion, and you still have to do some external noise suppression. But you you can keep this on. Uh, so I will not talk about slabbing. These are some advanced features uh, which um, you can try you can try out a little later. Yeah. So these are uh, so these are settings that I have here. Right. So the first thing you do is uh, you take the stack. So this is I think a 34 frame stack. So entire frame has been loaded here. And the first thing you want to do is uh, align all the frames. So you want to align all the frames together. And that will, that will take, its, take some time, maybe a few minutes to align. And uh, this button is going to show you the adjustments that is made for the alignments. Like for example, as you move along the stack, you can see that there are small minute movements. But that's fine. We will, uh, we will see how to work around that. And you can also see the focus is moving from the antenna. It's uh, 
to the mouth parts and things like that. So you can see the focus has moved. Right. So, so the first thing now we'll do is we'll create a Pmax stack out of this. So we will create this a Pmax stack. Okay, so this is going to take some time uh, or this. Okay, let me just cancel this operation. I already have the stack ready. Okay. Okay, so this is how the Pmax stack, stack is going to look like. So you look at the mess that the Pmax stack has given us. So you see uh, the moving mouth parts has created halos everywhere. You can see the motion echoes here. You can also see that the DOF is uh, not well controlled. We will try to work on, work on that as well. You can see halos here, some motion artifacts here as well. So let's try to do a DMAP stack. And if we go back here and do a DMAP stack, that is, I hit this. It's going to take some time once again to do that. It's going to take eight minutes, but let's not wait for that. Okay, 11 minutes. Okay. okay, so this is a DMAP stack that I have. Right, so a DMAP stack has done things slightly better. So you can see that uh, straight away that some of the, the halos are looking much better here. The halos are not that bad compared to the PMAX stack. Uh, and you can see there is still some lot of uh, uh, fuzziness here, but we will try to address that as well. So the next thing we should do is we should uh, go to the retouching phase. You click on start retouching here. And then, uh, yeah, so this is the DMAP stack that I have. Okay, so I've started the DMAP stack and I'm going to retouch the DMAP stack. DMAP, uh, stack. So you can see the tones here are looking very nice um, compared to the Pmax stack that I had. Let me just put the Pmax stack on the this side. You can see how much of noise the Pmax stack has brought in as compared to the DMAP. So DMAP is 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 really clean in its output uh, compared to the DMAP. Right. So now what we do is uh, we need to take sections portions from the source image. And you will need to uh, uh, retest the this image here. So let's take the antenna here. So this is where we have. So this is a halo which we're going to address. Right? It's looking better already. So so you go you go step by step here. I mean. So this, this is going to be a painstaking process. It's going to take you a few hours, tens of hours. Like for example, uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> the uh, hibiscus bird shot that I've shot, uh, it's taken me about 40 hours to process that. So that's the amount of effort you need to put in. But with that kind of effort, you get the best stack uh, that you can. I mean, uh, you need to uh, work at 100%, look at each of these things here and address each of those. Right, so this, so this is a halo here, so which we are addressing here. Yeah, so source is here. So source is on the left. Correct, correct. So that is that is what you do in the retouching phase. Uh, and you also can control your DOF. Like for example, uh, let's look at the uh, this part here. So it has a broken leg, which in my opinion doesn't look very good. But you can use uh, some of these out of focus parts to actually, you know, control your DOF here, right? So, so you can do things that uh, your camera cannot do. You can control DOF in ways that your camera, a single shot, cannot do. Uh, you can you can completely uh, create the image that you are that you want to create. I mean, everything is in your control here. Uh, so this is the way you actually go about um, retouching it. Like for example, for the mouth parts, let's look at the mouth parts here. So we take this. Okay. 
Okay, so this is where we have, and uh, we need to take this off here. Give it some sharpness here. So you can see straight away that this image is beginning to look uh, much better. It's, it's looking closer to the final image here. Uh, so you need to go over pixel by pixel, fixing up all these issues. And once you've done that, you have the final image, um, the like the kind I showed you. So this is uh, how focus stacking is done. Uh, so there are, of course, uh, advanced tools in this, uh, which I will not talk about here. Slabbing is a very important tool, especially when you want to do work with very large stacks. What slabbing does is it, it creates sub stacks out of uh, a bigger, if you have a stack running into a few hundred short shots, right? So you want to create stacks of this, smaller stacks. That's because you don't want the noise to be accumulated as you keep adding on more, more frames to the uh, stack. So you want to create smaller stacks and then create a stack of stacks. So that way you can control uh, the uh, noise better, better. And you can also do some uh, nice things like, for example, let's say for a, in this particular example itself, right? Maybe the antenna is completely, it's moved locations, but uh, you cannot fix it in Zareen or whatever way they're retouching. It's just completely out of, uh, it just moved out of position, right? So, but you can stack only that portion of it, then bring it into Photoshop and then you can align things and do a final final retouching uh, in, in Photoshop to get a stack out of it. So these, in the nutshell, are my methods that I use for focus stacking. OK. Um, OK, I, I think uh, so this is uh, pretty much what I wanted to cover in today's uh, talk. So I think Hardik had this, uh, he was talking to me about applications yeah. in other genres. So product photographers uh, will know that this is a very important tool that they, that they will be using. And of course, in landscape photography, wherein you want uh, things in complete focus, right from the foreground to the background. So it's a nice, nice uh, technique to be used in landscape photography. So if you guys haven't tried it out, you should just try it out next time in landscape photography. Okay, th thank you very much uh, for your time today. Uh, so this is what I wanted to show you. Yeah, we can address this as well. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. You can sit and respond. Yeah, you can sit and respond, of course. There's one right in the beginning here by Naveen, and there's one in the end. What is it? So like, yeah, that's it. it. I think this we already talked about our lenses. Our lenses which help move automatically instead of using the rain uh, are there lenses. So so any lens, uh, any OEM lens, like for example the 105 Nikon or the 60 mm macro lens from Olympus will do that. And uh, if there's electronic control between the camera and the lens, you can use the in-camera focus bracketing. It's a nifty feature to use, uh, uh, reduces the amount of work that you have to do. You're letting the camera do the work. Um, so so those lenses can be done, anything with the electronic control. So the lava lens, uh, which is a full manual lens, you cannot do that. So for that, you will have to use the other, other method that I described. Oh yeah, I forgot to show you the Helicon demo. Let me just show you the Helicon demo. I think somebody, Madan asked me a Helicon demo. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is the Helicon software. Um, so this is the, the other uh, stacker uh, which is out in the market. This uh, this this has, provides uh, comparable stacks uh, uh, to Zeri. But I think the place where it uh, doesn't work so well is the retouching. Uh, I, we can see that as well. Uh, I was describing the three methods that we have, the method A, method B, and method C. In my experience, method A doesn't work that well. And I tend to work with B and C. So let's go back to the ant stack that we had here. Uh, 
and let's just pull it into helicon focus now so the stack has been imported and let's just do a method b and uh, we need to set up a radius and and um, the smoothing radius here so this is once again in in, in our control this is exactly uh, trying to control the halos and things like that so you it's possible that you have to do multiple iterations of this uh, so it's possible that the moth parts you need to have a finer a smaller estimation radius but whereas for the antenna you might need a bigger estimation radius so you you can do multiple stacks and then merge everything together in the retouching phase so you just click render here and um, that's it now the depth map is being created here Pardon? Yes, it does. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So you can see uh, it's 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 rendered the stack here. It has similar uh, issues like in Zerine. Like you can see, the moth parts are all uh, out. Uh, there are echoes there, and you can see the halos here uh, around with the antenna and things like that. So you can do a retouching. Here as well, there's a retouching menu, and it actually shows you what is the source image here. So, for example, it says that I got this from 16544-1.jpg, and that is my source file. So, if I just click F9, I get that up here, and I can use that to, you know, retouch. So we are quite similar to how uh, to what Zerin does it, but not as flexible. Uh, so with Zerin, you can also use outputs to uh, you can use some partial outputs to uh, retouch the next output. So you can also work uh, with uh, externally uh, provided uh, outputs. Like for example, you can take a helicon output, import it into Zerin, things like that. So uh, completely, I mean, the retouching uh, it, it's all in the retouching. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, yeah. So what you do is, uh, uh, so there, there are there are instances where Helicon actually does a much better job than Zerin. And if you have instances like that, uh, but the retouching is not great here, right? Between what? So, like for example, I cannot take a, a partial output here. I cannot create a substack here. So I cannot choose uh, images one, two, and three and create a substack here. You cannot you cannot do it in the helicon. You need to create you need to create a fresh project for that, and then create a separate output for that. So it's not as flexible as Zerin. But uh, Zerin you can create you can start creating substacks for each of these. Maybe just the antenna, just the leg, things like that. And uh, and so if you have an output which is good in helicon, you can import it into Zerin, and then use that for retouching that. So, uh, yeah, so if you're working with JPEG, you'll get a JPEG. Uh, you can save it to TIFF as well. Um, so it's completely, yeah. So, uh, if you save the project uh, in what format? Like, they have their own format? Yeah, I'll show you the Zerin project. So, this is a Zerin project, the way it looks like. Uh, so, these are, this is holding the depth maps. Um, so I don't know if you can see it. This is the DMAP cache that is holding. Uh, so you, uh, if you're doing a DMAP uh, stack, uh, just keep this checked in the DMAP cache. So it's somewhere here in op options. Cache DMAP pass one for faster uh, work with multiple thresholds. You can use the DMAP. No, no, no. You can't do that. You can't mix and match. Yeah, you can't mix and match. But you can take the output. Like for example, this output is generated here, right? So you can re. Huh? That's a JPEG. That's a JPEG. So you you re-import that into this stack, and then use that for retouching your final output. So you can do all those. Yeah. Yeah. So we can have the stack, but the JPEG. Correct. Yeah. It is just another image. It's just another image in the in the stack. Yeah. So these are the generated images. So every time you you generate an image, so it saves it. So this this is all uh, lossless format. So I think it's saving it in TIFF because. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, you can come back. So you can. Uh, it's not necessary that you have to. You can stop your work midway, 
then correct you can restart from where you have taken off so but only thing is you get another image for you so you would have saved it here like for example i have done some work here on the antenna and i just save it as an image uh, but of course my mouth parts may not be complete i can save it come back reopen and continue with it again lossless yeah it's all, it's all lossless it saves as lossless and these are the preview images uh, that it creates these are low res images smaller images that it uses yeah just for fast viewing so this is how the project looks like uh, so the helicon is a uh, little more uh, it doesn't have too many controls even if you look at the preferences here right uh, so there's not much you can play with auto adjustments yeah so you can set this some adjustments here scale and adjustments here but apart from that nothing more okay so this is this is what i wanted to show today <laughs> Happen? Yeah. That is correct. Yeah. That is what I said. The the scale. So uh, stackers can compensate for the magnification. So this is this this particular uh, setting in in Zerine. Like for example, if you go back to tools. Correct. So you look at the scale. The scale will compensate for the magnification change. That means like 50% of the initial frame you have actually moved. No, no. It says that I I will magnify until 50%. It doesn't say that. Uh, this is just a indication saying that how far should Zerine go to uh, compensate for a magnification change. Correct. Yeah. So that is where uh, that is the focus breathing that I was talking about, right? So you're going to have some parts of the uh, the edges. which are going to be uh, discarded because you cannot use it now because of the change in the perspective is it possible to store the pixels in shortcut yeah i can do that huh i can uh, import it yeah you can see how it uh... <coughs> Okay, let's just take a stack of this dice that I have here. So that's a focus bracket. So. Just wait for it. So writing to the yeah. Stop. Let's just look at the bracket right now. So this is the uh, gecko that I was shooting. You can see how the focus is moving here. Right, and this is the dice that I just shot now. Right. So if you just load all of these into software, uh, we can get the stack out of it. 
So this is a 51 short stack. Um, yeah, I'm just using the JPEG output, but, uh, to, but, but otherwise the workflow should be that you take the raw images, then do some corrections, uh, maybe highlights, uh, shadows, Photoshop. Yeah. Photoshop or whatever is your, uh, if you if you use affinity you can do it in affinity as well and then sync everything sync the stack to the same same settings correct yes okay so let's just use uh, method b here and then uh, So this is the depth map that it's creating. You can see all the texture and things like that, that it's bringing in. And this is the final image uh, that is rendered. So uh, of course, you, this is maybe not a lot of retouching. Maybe here, there is some halo here that you may want to address the retouching phase. Uh, but otherwise, looks good uh, because Nothing was moving here. It was this. This this is an easy easy stack to work with. And maybe you want to control the DOF in this section here. So maybe you want to use retouching to. Um, yeah. <laughs> Huh? Simplest way to? Uh, yeah, so so I so I shoot full manual. Uh, so you shoot at a fast shutter speed. Uh, so typically I'm shooting at one by one sixtieth of a second. Uh, so. Uh, so that's that's okay, and I'm shooting with a flash most of the time. So which means for handheld focus stacking, uh, for if you're uh, out in the field, right? So any kind of uh, shakes from your hand and from the wind and things like that, that's that's compensated because I'm shooting fast. Uh, so what else uh, do I use? Um, so I also use. Um, huh? No, no, no. Those rails are just to show you guys. I don't use them. <laughs> so I use this this for this for microscopy. This, when I started off earlier on, when I just started focus tagging, I, I tried this, uh, of course, didn't work very well out in the field. It's just lying at home right now. <laughs> yeah. You need to? Much better? OK. <laughs> I can't do it. Oh, for this, this is at f5.6. This is f5.6. So this is my, hold on, let me just uh, read out the settings for you. So this is shot at uh, one by one hundredth of a second because it's a focus bracket and uh, Olympus limits you to one by one hundredth of a second. Uh, and uh, I'm using f5.6 because that's the sharpest uh, operating point of my lens. And I want the sharpest uh, uh, quality output from my uh, stack. So you could shoot a higher F11 also work. Mm -hmm. I mean, completely your your choice. Um, and I also shoot uh, a very low ISO, ISO 100, so because I don't want to carry uh, accumulate noise in the process. That's one by 30, 32. Which one? No, no. So that depends. So you so you you adjust as you keep going along. So maybe there are brighter subjects, like for example, if it's on a bright surface. So one by thirty-two might be uh, blowing out uh, highlights. So which means you go uh, a stop lower. 
so that you can just uh, adjust as you can, as you go along. But uh, uh, but if you go higher, right, one by sixteen and things like that, then your recycle time begins to um, slow down your flash, which means you can't shoot as fast. So typically, try to be uh, use a lower flash power so that you can shoot fast. Okay. Uh, so any more questions? If you have, uh, we can take it. <laughs> Yeah. Macro photography, I use it. Of course, uh, you could use for use it for product photography and for landscape photography as well. So. Yeah, so so watch so watch ads they will they use focus stacking. You definitely don't want blurry blurry edges on the watch, right? I mean people trying to buy your product, you want a focus stack, everything in focus. So watches for sure they use. Yeah. I think one of the I think watch brand you had charged and you had during your presentation. I see, okay. Yeah, uh, we rather have a field on the lens. Okay. Like, I see, okay. Because when pictures pass through the software, okay. there are more problems. Okay. For example, my other ones. Nice. Although, uh, although I can say I'm familiar with it, at least five shots. I mean, give us a wide angle shot. If it doesn't join, then the fact is not working. Doesn't play okay. Right. Demonstrate? Oh, with the Nikon? Let me just. What about the. It's creating a map, right? It's map. So that is with the depth map stack. What about the LiDAR? I don't know. No idea. So uh, the I think the lidar it uses for face recognition as far as I know. I see. It must be doing that. If it's creating a depth, it must be doing that. Yeah. So this is the uh, same, I think there's a request for, how do we do it with? Yes, I was moving the camera. So this is a this is a handle focus stack wherein I'm moving the camera camera forwards. Or you could do the other way around. Uh, if you're holding on to a branch and things like that, you move the subject itself closer by. Right? So now if you look at the uh, want to look at the final output of this. Oh, the display is just a DSLR. It won't show you. It's just the uh, preview right now. Show you. Right. Yeah, so this is a stack. So the yeah, so this uh, the focus is more. Um, so I can load it into software and show you. Huh? You want to see it? Okay. <laughs> I can't hear you. Huh. If you if you are using a slave flash, slave flash is it? Yeah, you can use slave flash for. Uh, yes. Uh, so there are there are ways to do that. Uh, I I I do use a second flash sometimes for focus stacking as well. 
Uh, so you can use a uh, trigger. Uh, so you will. Yes, it does. So the so the MF12 will will sync at the same speed as this. As this. Yes, you can do a. Yes, you can do a 10 FPS uh, focus stack using MF12. MF12 has a secondary flash, and this is the. Uh, yes. Yeah. Which one? I didn't get your question, sir. This one? This one or the camera you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is a Renox. This is a Renox 250. So this is a clip-on lens. So this will bring it up to 2x magnification. So this is the uh, 105 uh, Nikon. So this is a 1 is to 1. Uh, so this will bring it up to the same uh, configuration as my Olympus, which is a two, uh, which is a one is to one, but with this, uh, with the crop factor and everything, right? You would see the same image. Both of these are prime lenses. No, is the snap on better on prime or the other lens? I haven't used it on other lenses, but yes, you can. You can use it. So people use it in 7300 uh, with some really nice results. So you can use it on the 7300, and you can take close-ups with this. I have made a few, not many. I mean, the, um, maybe this uh, monitor size. Yeah. 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 Uh, Yes, you can. Yes, I think. <laughs> yes, you can. You you can definitely do that. I haven't done that. So, like for example, the hibiscus bird. That's a 110 megapixel image. So, yeah. No, I haven't tried. Yeah. No, I made a few prints. Not many. Very few prints. So just to see the uh, uh, sharpness of the stand with the that kind of as he's saying, maybe with the printer file we'll get it. Printed. Yeah, yeah. We'll get it printed. Okay. <laughs> Yes. So you can go, you can 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 you use the uh, mic? For the ant? No, that is not this. That is handed. Okay. That is handled shot using this. This is the gear I've shot it with. So the microscopy shots, uh, I'll show you which are the microscopy shots. Uh, so there's an objective that I've mated to the uh, DSLR. So it's a 10x objective. And of course, uh, now I have uh, more more of those objectives as well. I have 4x, 10x, 20x, 40x, and 60x. Um, so which you can connect in some fashion to the, uh, to the DSLR. Um, so and you can use them to take photographs. Of course, taking photographs at uh, larger magnification is, is harder because your DOF gets shallow. So your stacks become massive. Yeah. So this is uh, electronic, this one, which you use only for photo micrography. It is, uh, you can control it using your computer or there's an app, app as well. So you can uh, just set up the uh, set up app. Uh, it's, it's, it's completely, uh, it's Bluetooth controlled. Uh, it would uh, download the settings into that, and then the program would run.
So I use Godox flashes. Yeah. Uh, so this is a TT68 way, which I'm using on my Nikon. Works well. Um, and on this, I'm using the 863. This is the latest model. Uh, it has a very fast recycle time. Uh, yeah, it's lithium, lithium ion, yeah. So this, this is, uh, you have to put in the four uh, batteries in this. So of course, if anybody wants to shoot, uh, please feel free to shoot. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> you can do it on a camera phone as well. Focus stacking. We can probably plan a session. Yeah, we can have practical session. Now, at least they have some idea. So maybe some of the workshop or even one session where they can take a very subject. Don't get any interest in the same time. Thank you. 